Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about our uh, frame on leadership and the thinking behind the School of Inspired Leadership. So the reason some of us uh, started this school is because we were concerned about businesses not taking responsibility for the state of our world. Uh, we said to ourselves, actually businesses have such a profound impact on the way we live now. And in fact, businesses are more powerful than all the political forces because they have so much of power, they cross borders, they break barriers, and businesses are the only organizations that unite people. So we said to ourselves, on one hand, businesses have this potent force. On the other hand, if you look at work itself, uh, you and I spend more time in thinking about work working, traveling to work, and even doing work virtually when we are away from the workplace. So actually, most of our waking hours are spent in organization and workplaces. And so the way we work has a profound impact on the way we live. Because whatever we practice in the workplace, we tend to take that to our communities, to our neighborhoods. And so those forces shape our present culture and our present values. So what are we in the business world paying most attention to? So in a recent survey of uh, CEOs done by PwC, developing leadership and talent pipeline was considered as the most important priority. Meeting with customers was another. Managing organizational efficiency was another. Setting strategy and managing risks was another. Developing markets outside our home base was another. So if you notice all these things that we are talking about, it is about how to make our own companies most successful. And this is the survey of CEOs. Very few business leaders talk about the impact the business world has on the state of our planet. And this is also true in our own country in India that we have this uh, business world talking about how to grow, earn more returns, serve customers, maybe create workplaces which are good for our employees. But very few of us pay attention to the impact we have on the state of our own respective countries or even the state of the planet. We have been also been, we have been noticing for last many years that there are some significant challenges that the business world is facing. For instance, the whole financial crisis which started in North America, the complete question mark on the current state of capitalism, or for that matter, the questions that we are asking in Europe saying, in the difficult times when we are not growing, how do we take care of aspirations of our people? On the other hand, we have economies like China and India which are growing, which are taking away so many of the Earth's resources. Are we growing in the right way? Is this consumption-led model going to be the best way for the world to develop? So I think these are some very fundamental questions and I think even the forces of the Arab Spring, the Occupy Wall Street movement, the anti-corruption movement in India, all these questions are talking about new aspirations of people. And in today's interconnected world of uh, Twitter and social media and Facebook and revolutions being caused by the electronic media. Everything is so interconnected that no matter how we pretend to be insulated, whatever happens in one part of the world has a big impact on the other. So we said to ourselves that today the kind of leadership we need to develop has to be very different from the leadership of yesterday. We said, first of all, leaders need to develop much stronger understanding of 
their own selves, what is truly important to them, what are the questions that they want to take responsibility for, how are their actions and behaviors and the way we as leaders live, what impact it has on the state of our world. This self-awareness, which helps us to truly understand and observe our own selves, we call this the practice of mindfulness. Being fully mindful of the way our own mind works. Being mindful of the emotions that make us move in one direction. Which make our own ways of thinking shape the choices that we make. The way our own physical energy of our own selves as leaders either make our organizations better workplaces or in fact they have other kinds of negative impacts. So this practice of mindfulness requires us to be fully present and so it's that very beautiful quality of a leader to say am I a witness to my own behavior? Could I become the observer of my own body, my own mind? my own thinking process and do I know how to be fully present so I understand the world better, my stakeholders better, my people better, nature better, the forces better. In our approach on leadership development, we teach the mindfulness practice uh, through a wonderful combination of wellness, wellness for the body. So we have a yoga practice in all our programs, the breathing practice in all our programs, and we the right eating, the right food that we eat, the kind of personal habits that we have which impact our physical, emotional, intellectual and spiritual health. So this concept of total wellness starts with leaders taking responsibility for their own wellness. And so that is the whole practice of mindfulness. Uh, this, if I may say so, is taking responsibility for our own being. So that when we take responsibility for our own being, we create workplaces in which uh, people also have the practice of well-being. The next aspect when you have this kind of uh, subtle quality of mindfulness or learning to live in the present is then to be aware of the kind of choices we make. Is this choice the right thing for all my stakeholders? We talk about multiple stakeholders, but in most of our workplaces, we put a lot of attention to a shareholder as a stakeholder, to a customer as a stakeholder, and to a large extent on the employee as a stakeholder. And so most of us as CEOs believe that the word CEO is one for customer, employee, and owner. But we are now asking ourselves new questions. That is that possible to have that limited view of stakeholders? Can you be truly an organization which is a strong institution in the long term if you do not take responsibility for the impact on the community? If you do not take the responsibility for the impact on the environment? And if you don't take responsibility for the impact on our planet. So this new C for community, E for environment and O for our planet as a whole is the concept of leadership that we are talking about in terms of CEO square, the customer and the community, the employee and the environment the owner and the one planet that we are part of. And so, 
The choices that we make, if we make choices which are in the narrow interest only of one stakeholder, it obviously has negative impact in the future on the other stakeholders. So this aspect of being conscious of the trade-offs that we make is in fact the thinking behind ethics. Because we have a right to do many things as leaders, but are we doing the right thing for all our stakeholders? This difference between our right to do things and the right thing to be done is what we call ethics in our school. And the way we teach this in all our leadership programs is to simulate live cases, business cases in which we actually play the role of the protagonist and look at the ethical dilemmas of our times. Here is an aggressive accounting being suggested by a sharp CFO. What is the impact it will have long term on my company? Here is a new technology that as a healthcare company that we are, our R&D lab wants us to take. And we are not being fair in the way we are carrying out trials of this new technology on human beings. How would it impact the long term future of our company? Ethics is not just being fair and is not merely speaking the truth but avoiding any form of deception or doing things which compromise the interest of one stakeholder even in a subtle way without being aware of it fully. You see, this is, tells us the way we lead our thinking process. Leaders leading their own thinking process which to think in a more holistic, in a more balanced, in a more ethical way. Then comes the whole practice of leadership which talks about leadership with empathy. You see, even though you may be very ethical, if, you, if we do not put ourselves into the shoes of others and experience the emotions that other stakeholders have, what they really feel about us. For instance, why does the community not trust business leaders? Along with politicians, business leaders today are least trusted. Why? What's the pain they are going through, which is making us completely get alienated from them, which is the larger community? If we recognize the pain of people, in the community, if you recognize the pain of our planet, what do we do about it? See, that's the practice of compassion. Do we create workplaces in which we build compassion as a key leadership attribute? Where, on one hand, we are compassionate about what our customers, suppliers and business partners feel. On the other hand, even when we take tough decisions and make hard choices, for instance, when we are downsizing, do we do it with deep compassion in our hearts, where employees know that even the hard choices are personally painful for us? Do we really take joy in reducing somebody else's suffering, in helping people in need? You know, compassion is not necessarily only helping the poor or helping the needy or helping those in pain. Compassion is also, in, in a positive sense, how do we create a sense of connection and community in our workplaces? Do we build that human connection where people feel truly that we are interconnected, we are interdependent? We, together, we can solve the problem of our organization and the world. You see, a lot of times we tend to have fragmentation. We operate in our own silos and business units. We try to cover our own areas of accountability. 
but we lose that sense of connection. We work together for years in the same company without ever getting to know one another. Why are we scared of intimacy? Why, do, why are we afraid to talk about emotions at the workplace? Why are basic human instincts of the human connection, feeling for one another, celebrating a sense of togetherness and community? Why are we putting these watertight compartments that this is my personal life, this is my professional life and the two don't have anything to do with each other? This fragmentation that we are doing in our lives is leading to lots of emotional tension and stress levels and producing all kinds of other symptoms of new disease. Somewhere we are afraid that if we get that sense of connection and compassion at the workplace, would we compromise on productivity, would we become less efficient, less demanding. Now we need to challenge this paradigm. My own experience tells me, of working in different companies around the world, is that you can have high performance and high connection at the same time. We cannot have the assumption that high touch, high connection means compromise on standards. So in our school, in all part of our leadership development programs, we have something called social innovation. The leaders whom we develop work on a real world problem for those who are suffering. It could be the kids in the slums in India, it could be people who are wanting to make the city more green. It could be people working on solving a complex problem of urban planning. But something which benefits the collective. And when people from businesses work together to solve real social problems, they improve their emotional intelligence. They improve trust with each other. So by doing this work together outside for a social cause, they improve trust levels within the company. They build a sense of community. And this has a profound impact on their own organizational performance. And so we call that the practice of compassion, which is an integral part of all our leadership development. From there, we move to understanding how are we utilizing the earth's resources so sustainability is for us not just talking about being green choosing more technology which is energy efficient and doing that but it actually is linked to what Gandhi talked about when he said, there is enough in the world for everybody's need, but not enough for everybody's greed. So the question we are asking our leaders is, how are we at the personal and professional levels? How are we taking responsibility for simplifying our lives in the way we travel, in the way we communicate, in the way we live? Could we think about when organizations, when we are choosing choices, are we doing something just to create an impact? You can build an office building consuming this much of the earth's resources or you can have a very ornate and impressive structure which uses that much amount of earth's resources. Right from designing our workplaces to every practice of ours, are we taking responsibility for the choices we make in terms of using the earth's resources? Are we having a sense of balance between today and tomorrow? So right from design of the buildings, in choosing policies, adopting technology, to the personal habits of how much of water I consume, how much of carbon that am I taking responsibility for in the way I live? I think these are both personal choices and organizational choices 
that we have to get more sensitive to because a lot of times I have noticed that we as leaders are not aware of the consequences of the decisions that we make on these dimensions. And this thing about global warming and all that that we are talking about, especially in countries like India, where we talk about the fact that it is almost the tax we have to pay of growth and poverty elevation is that in the process we have the right to damage our environment. I mean, this is something, nothing is the way, for example, we are, uh, we are polluting our rivers in this country, in our country, in India. And somewhere we are getting off the hook by saying, you know, we are an underdeveloped country and we are, uh, you know, consumption is much lesser than the West and therefore we have a right to damage Mother Nature more. I think this is completely unacceptable as a philosophy like it is completely unacceptable for many of our Western companies to think that they are not answerable to the rest of the world on how much they consume in the way they live and the way they operate. So that's sustainability. Lastly, in the way we talk about leadership, we say the most perhaps important question is that the worldview that I am sharing with you is coming out of my understanding of my life's purpose and my own strengths. You see, when I understand what my true calling is, my own purpose in life is, and when I truly take responsibility for what my own gifts are, and when I learn to use my own gifts towards my purpose, I am acting in an inspired way. I am giving off my best. And when I am enabling others to do so, I am building inspired leadership. That means, one of the most important questions we need to ask at every stage of our lives is, what is truly important to us? What are we being called upon? What are we being called upon to do? And then to say, what are we blessed with? What are the gifts that we have? And then the third question, how are we using these gifts towards things that truly matter to us? So, when we enable others to do the same thing, when we work together with others and say, what is that person, what does that person truly care about? What does that person have as unique gifts? How can we enable that person to use her own gifts towards becoming better at things that matter to that person. Then we are helping that person to lead a more inspired life. This recognition that each one has a unique set of values and purpose, each person has a unique set of gifts, and then how can we work together to make each other successful is what we call the practice of diversity. And we do this by giving a lot of attention to designing teams with greater diversity. By bringing in uh, faculty from around the world with different uh, worldviews. By exposing all the leaders that we develop to different situations, cultural and otherwise. By making our own uh, leaders whom we are developing to work part of teams with greater diversity. And to truly practice the diversity is not just saying, I am man, you are woman, I am old, you are young, I am Indian, you are European. But to say, if you care about this issue and you deeply value that, and if you are very good at doing something, how are you using your own strengths towards things that matter to you? When I learn to do that and work with you in that way, I truly am practicing the value of diversity. So these five dimensions of the practice of mindfulness to ethics, to compassion, to sustainability and diversity are what we call the five pillars of the school of inspired leadership. And these five pillars, in fact in this uh, school building that we have in which I am shooting this video, we have five floors in our campus. And each floor is dedicated to this pillar. And we said these five put together define character of a leader. And character.
character is the one that gives the strength to the individual. So this is what we say, building leaders with a vision of character, strong character. We of course also in all our leadership development, we talk about uh, helping people to become far more innovative because that's one thinking capability that you can develop. But we believe innovation happens because of strong character. In fact, lots of our research leads us to this conclusion that innovation is fueled by strong character. And so with uh, this strong character and with the competence of thinking holistically, having the critical thinking skills to think more holistically, whole systems, makes us look at innovation in that way. And finally, that this whole aspect of looking at it is finally asking ourselves this question to say, all that we seek in the world are as a result of the way we look at the world. If we want to improve the world, we have to change ourselves. And so, as Gandhi said, uh, become the change that you seek in the world. Or uh, So this is the whole aspect of taking more responsibility, saying if we seek something in the world, we actually become like that. And so even in the most challenging circumstance, how can we still feel that sense of wholeness, the sense of uh, purpose, and that deep enthusiasm in the heart to work for a purpose of taking responsibility and making our world better. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I love to engage in any follow-up questions you have, may have and I look forward to interacting with you and your company in the future. Thank you very much.